On this episode of Things That Matter, Richard, John, and I are discussing the pastor as a shepherd, taking care of God's flock, the people of God. Stay tuned. Hi, and welcome to this episode of Things That Matter. I'm your host, Brian Broderson, and I'm here in the studio today with my good friends, Richard Semino and John Wang, and we are continuing our conversation on pastoral ministry. And today, we're going to talk about the pastor as a shepherd, or as John put it, the pastor as a pastor. <laughs> you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, we're going to talk about it right now. <laughs> so. So what are we going to talk about, John? Well, again, this is um, going to be a fun conversation because this um, relates to our calling. And not only for us, but um, I think um, a lot of people that are going to be watching this program and just wanting to hear our thoughts on, on the subject of the pastoral ministry. And I think it's really important, too, to, to just clarify um, at the beginning, um, when we're talking about the office of the pastor, you know, there there are uh, there are other words that are used to describe the same office, right? Like elder and mm -hmm. overseer. But I, I find that the term pastor is really interesting because the Bible is using um, a trade, really, that was something that was common during the time of the Bible. Like people, when they heard the word pastor, they could immediately think about. Um, something that was common in an agricultural world where there was a real shepherd with a real flock. And so for them to be thinking about a shepherd or a pastor, because that's what pastor means, they're thinking of someone who feeds, someone who cares for the flock, someone who um, disciplines at times, um, obviously someone who leads and someone who protects. And so I would just love um, to just engage in that conversation um, because all of those things, it reminds us that a pastor isn't just an occupation. Yeah. Uh, God is connecting us with his flock, with real people that, are been, that have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just start from the general and just move in. So for the, both of you guys, um, in terms of your experiences as a pastor, like what are some of the general things that that you've observed in the years that you've been serving in this capacity has been some of the most important lessons learned? Um, and, and maybe we can even start with the topic of calling. I, the Lord clearly called me in an evening. Um, I was actually at a, like this, like young adult youth meeting at a um, Blessed Sacrament Church in Westminster on a Wednesday night. And this guy got up and taught on Moses and and uh, said, you know, tonight God's going to put the shepherd staff in some of your hands mm -hmm. and we're going to wait on the Lord. Wow. And there are going to be people that are going to come and um, they have the gift of, of prophecy. And some, don't be surprised if somebody comes up to you and puts their hand on you and, and calls you, in, God calls you in the ministry. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought, well, it's like, man, I'll pray for these people. <laughs> not that, not that they're going to have their hands laid on them. This guy came up to me and he goes, brother, the Lord's put the shepherd staff in your hand. Wow. And it was just that clear. Wow. And, How come uh, I have never known that I, story? It's my deep secret. Years. It's my deep secret. Uh, well, we bear witness that he did do that. He put that shepherd staff. And, he, and, and that just, it, it, there was this confluence of, you know, being blessed by Chuck's ministry and we, I was already involved in like doing evangelism and through, you know by way of music and stuff but that was just like I just it was I just want, I want to yes I want to do that and and of course Chuck did it in such a way that you could go I can do that yeah and um, so that was how I got <laughs> called in, into <laughs> ministry and you know it took a few years for that to happen. Mm. Um, you were witness to some of those <laughs> yes. frustrating moments along with some other dear friends and my wife in particular, but yeah, that's mm. how I was called. Wow, that's a great story. And, and you know, for me, my my calling had some, a similar moment, but there was, what preceded that moment was just kind of um, God moving me into a role mm -hmm. that I, I, I would never have defined it as pastoring or shepherding, but that, as I look back on it now, that's actually what I was doing, and mm -hmm. it was just something that happened where 
Uh, I was around a group of people. We had all formally been lost. We all got found. And somehow, for whatever reason, God just put his hand on me to, mm -hmm. to kind of be the leader. Mm -hmm. You know, people wanted to find out what the Bible meant about something. They would come and ask me the question. Or people wanted to get prayed for, they'd come and ask me to pray for them. And it was all very natural. It wasn't, you know, I didn't try to make any of that happen. But but there did come a moment with that that actual group of people. We were having a prayer meeting, and it was in the wee hours of the morning, morning literally. And uh, the one of the guys in the group he prayed that the Lord would um, take me out of my uh, job that I was in, which was a I was doing a new construction plumbing at the time. It was a great job. I loved it. Take me out of that and put me in full time pastoral ministry. Mm -hmm. And when he prayed that, I thought that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Uh, I like my job. <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna. I need to make money. And you know, it was by the end of the week, I was out of that job. Wow. And it was. Wow. Uh, there was not one thing in my control in that. You know. And and then within, it, like you said, Rich, it wasn't immediately. I went from there to working at a church, but there was about a year process where God kind of took me into another area where I got to exercise just that gifting and evangelism for a year, just in the, again, back in the work world, but in a completely mm -hmm. different context. And then one day uh, I received a call from Pastor Chuck, who was my father-in-law by then. And he said, I want you to come down to the church and I want you to join the, the staff. And I want to, you know, want you to come and be part of the ministry team. And I was like, well, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah. I know you don't know what to do. That's why I'm asking you to come. I want to train you because you've expressed a desire to serve the Lord. I've seen God's hand on your life. So so that's what that's what I want you to do. So I did. And you both were in your 20s when you heard and sensed God's call into pastoral ministry. Mm -hmm. Late so, 20s for me. Yeah. 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 Early for me. I was 22. Gosh, mm -hmm. that, that is so encouraging, especially for... You know, young adults that are listening to this or watching this, and I think that sometimes we, you know, there 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 are so many things that get piled onto a list of what needs to be checked off before you become yeah. a pastor. That sometimes I think that young adults get discouraged, thinking, "Well, maybe that's something that the Lord will have for me when I'm in my 40s or yeah. 50s." You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but I, I I think it's just encouraging to be reminded that that you both as um, along with so many, have been called mm -hmm. at such an early age. Yeah. So looking back um, in all the years that you've been serving the Lord as pastors, what would be some of the most important lessons that you would say that you've learned mm -hmm. regarding this call? You know, we're living in a time when we, we've got this this thing in, in the Christian culture, uh, the celebrity pastor, mm -hmm. Where you know it's kind of hard to distinguish between a pastor and a celebrity, um, you know, rock star type of a thing, and that is not the biblical picture yeah. of a pastor. And and I want to say that not to put anybody down who has that position of celebrity pastor, but but just to for so people can recognize that there are thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of people who have no celebrity status. They they nobody knows them except the little flock that they shepherd. And what they're doing is, it's vital, it's wonderful, it's it's what God's called them to do. They're humbly just taking care of the flock that God's given yeah. them, yeah. and great is their reward in heaven. And uh, they're never going to appear in the news because they embezzled money, or they ran off with their secretary, or they did any of those mm -hmm. kind of things. They're faithful men who just yeah. love God, and nobody outside of their little world will maybe yeah. even know they ever existed, but God knows they exist yeah. because they're His servants and they're His shepherds. So I wanted to, I wanted to say that. You know, there's a passage in um, Isaiah 40, verse 11, and it, it's a prophecy about Jesus, but it's such a beautiful picture mm. of, of pastoral ministry because Jesus, of course, is he's the pastor right he's, right. he's the great shepherd. Mm -hmm. he's the great shepherd of the sheep he's the mm -hmm. chief shepherd and and it says this it says he tends his flock like a shepherd he gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart mm -hmm. he gently leads those that have young and i think man that is such a beautiful picture yeah of what pastoral ministry is, you know. And, and I think the thing just to answer specifically your question John, the thing that I've learned 
I've learned many things, but the one thing that I've re really learned is that um, God loves his people. Mm. And if we love God, then we're going to love his people mm -hmm. like he does. And that's really what Jesus said to Peter when he restored Peter to his calling. And Peter refers to himself as a shepherd, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what did Jesus say? Um, Do you love me, Peter? Then feed my sheep. Mm. Yeah. Take care of my people. So what I what I've learned over the years. I mean, I, I kind of knew it going into it, but I know it more now. Is that this is a beautiful thing, yeah. and it's yeah. something that God is very um, interested in, mm -hmm. <laughs> and He's He's very much wanting us to do this. Uh, in a way that will honor him and, and in a way that he, as the great shepherd of the sheep, would have it done. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Yeah. How about you, Richard? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think back to the times when I, when I finally did get to be in, in full-time pastoral ministry that I made the huge mistake um, of misunderstanding the nature of it. And there were times when the sheep seem like an inconvenience mm -hmm. rather than the point <laughs> yeah. right and yeah, yeah. and and uh um that verse is so perfect so it just it just dispels any question about what's the point mm -hmm. and the point is is that jesus has actually asked us to take care of his sheep mm -hmm. like that and um it really that's where you know being an opinionated guy, you know, I'm always got a strong opinion. I see things black and white. It's like, I just feel like, well, everybody surely needs to know what my opinion is here because I'm right, mm -hmm. right? So, and that's not shepherding anybody, at least not well. So I think it's a it's a matter of what you said. It's like, I, I need to be loving Jesus. And if, 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 if that isn't, um, if I'm not loving the sheep like that, then I can say what I want about Jesus. I can mm -hmm. teach a million Bible studies, but... Yeah. I'm not loving Jesus if I'm yeah. not doing that. Because I remember Chuck, when 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 we brought Mike Harris and Jim Gallagher on as like paid interns, um, when I was still here, and um, I said Chuck, you know, um, they're going to start on this day, and and he says he says well let's bring them in the, on their first day. So I brought him in, and I said Chuck, is there anything you want to say to these guys before they start? And he kind of just leaned back in his chair, and he just said, love Jesus. <laughs> and I'm waiting for more. And that was just it. That's all he said was love Jesus. And then after this protracted silence, he said, because if you love Jesus, you'll love the sheep. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. End of story. <laughs> yeah. And that was it. They're like, okay, let's go. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So then why do you think there's such a misunderstanding um, among so many people within so many churches um, regarding the biblical role of a shepherd, a pastor. Mm -hmm. um, it's sad, but it just seems like we hear more complaints about faulty leadership than we do of yeah. healthy shepherding. Mm -hmm. um, are, are there things that you've observed that, that would be warnings, mm -hmm. especially for the person that is you know, taking his first steps in this call? Mm -hmm. Well, I think if we if we define what it is, then mm -hmm. I think we're going to obviously uh, be a step further to actually doing it and doing it the right way. So, if you take this Isaiah uh, forty eleven verse, um, I think it's I, I think the New King James um, he feeds is the way it puts mm -hmm. it there. He feeds. So I think if if you if you break it down, and I've done this before in teaching, and I've done it in written form, but if you look at it from the standpoint of this, this is my job. My job is to feed, to tend, and to lead mm -hmm. the flock of God. Mm -hmm. Those are the words. And I think if, if those things are done to the best of your ability through the help of God's Spirit, then you're going to succeed at mm -hmm. having a healthy mm -hmm. flock. The, the size of the flock, all of that stuff, that's not necessarily your concern mm -hmm. the health of the flock is is our concern so but it, but if you just let's just break down those three things you know feeding tending leading what is, what does that look like so feeding the flock what does that look like well giving them the word of god yeah as, you know as much and as often as many ways as you can yeah. in a way that they can receive it yeah and um the the tending is actually engaging them yeah 
and being with them, and that changes. In the, the you know, uh, Keller wrote a great article on on uh, um, how the size of church affects the dynamics of leadership, sure. and, and on, on the tension that you get on both sides of the equation, the mm -hmm. person, the, the the flock, and the pastor as well. Yeah. Now that changes things, but still. Even if you if if the congregation gets to the size where you can't personally be involved, then your great yeah. desire is to have people alongside of you yeah. who can be where you can't be and yeah. to do it well because you love the sheep and yeah. and then the leading is I think that's a vision yeah and and leading them on mission yeah exactly yeah I I agree to you know to feed yes that that is you know God has called us to 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 do that and he's given us his word so we don't have to figure out what to feed them because <laughs> we, we got it you know the menu is all it's right here i got a bible in front of me so um and like you said rich it's just giving them god's word and nourishing them uh in in god's word because that is the means through which god builds them builds people up you yeah. know spiritually strengthens them but then there is that that aspect of tending, and I like to think of that as more, you know, giving personal attention. Yep. And I think regardless of, of however large your congregation grows or however, um, you know, vast your ministry becomes, you cannot lose sight of the need to tend. And mm -hmm. even though, you know, I'm the senior pastor, even though I have a, a large number of uh, guys who work with me, uh, that I can delegate to, and we all do this together as a team, you know, I still feel I have to be personally engaged mm -hmm. in people's lives, you know. So so just a quick example, this past week, I, you know, I mean, so, you know, I travel. I'm Next week I'll be out of town. The next two weeks after that I'll be out of town. I, I do all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, last week I found myself with uh, an 84-year-old mm -hmm. woman in the church who's desperate and it's like, I, I can't talk to anybody but Brian. I mm. gotta talk to Brian. And she's right, I, I gotta talk to her. You know, mm. I'm, her, I'm her pastor, yeah. she sees me as that. So I had to do that and not, not had to, like, oh gosh, I, gotta, I, I was happy to do it. So I spent a few hours with her, just comforting her, just trying to help her navigate, you know, the issues in her life. And then even as recent as yesterday, you know, uh, a friend who's suddenly in the midst of a health crisis, who's been part of our church for many years, I, I had to go over to his home and see him. Mm -hmm. Not because somebody told me to, but because you that's what to. a shepherd does. You know, yeah. that's what you do. The, these are God's people. And so I think that tending, that, that part's always there. It's mm -hmm. always going to be there. Like you said, it's going to vary, you know, with the growth mm -hmm. of the church and all that. But... If I disengage from that, yeah. then I'm not fulfilling my role as a mm -hmm. pastor, as a, as a shepherd, as, as the scripture would paint that picture. And then I agree, Rich, with uh, the leading as vision. You yeah. know, that I, I think, you know, God is, you know, like if you even imagine a flock and a shepherd, a shepherd is leading a flock somewhere. You know, yes. you, you, you hardly see a stationary situation, yeah. right? The shepherd's out in the front, yes. you know, you got the staff and he's, and, you know, the, uh, flocks following along and and that's part of our thing too but that necessitates we have vision mm -hmm. how do we get vision well we got to get it from the great shepherd yeah lord what what do you want to do with this particular uh group of your sheep? that's right within this last year i felt more than ever the need to be engaging people who who are now they're they're involved in in, in leadership within the church and there was always one of the guys that, that are a part of our pastoral team that was there you know, involved with them. And I just felt like, you know, I know I know this this one young lady, you know, she was single when she started in our living room and now she's married and has children and here and her husband are really shaping the children's church in Metropolis are like K through fifth grade thing. And I just felt like I want to more than ever now I should be connecting with them with my vision directly, like just I just want to speak to them. I just want to hear them. I want to hear what's going on. I, I don't want it to be through another set of ears and eyes. Like it's, you know, especially as I get closer to when I ought to be moving away, mm -hmm. you know, or moving on to whatever it is that God has for me at the end of this thing. It's like I want more than ever that vision to be planted in their in their hearts deeply, and it's been so rich and so rewarding mm -hmm. in in both directions, you yeah. know, with them. And and I'm so glad that. Um, I was never like distance, and, 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 uh, and uh, they couldn't, not that they couldn't get to yeah. me, but I just felt like more than anything, it's like, I want you to tell me your vision. What are you dreaming mm -hmm. about? Yeah. 
and how can I help you? And it's been sweet. It's been yeah, really yeah. sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, there's something. There, there's just always something that happens when you're you're engaging on that level with people. Where I don't know. It just, it just for me, it always ends up being uh, unexpectedly edifying. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, you're just like um, I had a, a an appointment you know, recently with a gal and. And just sitting there and listening to her story, and as as she's telling her story, I'm just like, wow, you know, Lord, you are so good. It is mm -hmm. amazing just what mm -hmm. you do in people's lives and where you brought this woman from and the journey she's on. And I feel like I am actually missing out on a tremendous blessing if I'm disengaging mm -hmm. from yes. the sheep. It's mm -hmm. as I engage, and and I think too. It helps us to better minister to the kind of the collective flock, yeah. mm -hmm. because we get a sense of where people are at. Absolutely, you know, it's easy to get detached, right? If you're in your like your, if you got a pastor world over here where mm -hmm. all you're really concerned about is Instagram and Twitter mm -hmm. and Facebook, and you got to get your name and your image out there, and all yeah. that, you know, that's like a fake world. Yeah, it is. Um, and it's not going to benefit you or anybody else. But man, when you're you're engaging with God's people. You're being blessed. You're being edified. You're understanding. Well, man, this is where people are at. This yeah. is what they're grappling with. You know, you can read in a book about the culture and what people yeah. think and all, but how much better to have a conversation with somebody and let them tell you what they think. Yeah, yeah. That's, and what that's they're that's facing great. and yeah. how they're facing yeah. it. And, yeah. and that and that also influences how you preach, right? I mean, yeah. the, in terms of content, like I, I sometimes have thought about this too. Like, how often have we heard sermons where? where the pulpit is addressing topics or seeking to answer questions that no one's no asking, asking yeah. you know <laughs> and and just all of those passages whether it's the prophet Ezekiel there at the river Kabar and it says I sat where they sat or the fact that Jesus God became a man and mm -hmm. he literally got under our skin in mm -hmm. incarnation and he walked among us and and I found that one of the the biggest challenges at least for me is if I if I am not intentionally, um, you know, as as Paul says, to take heed to yourself, I can find myself leaning towards this unhealthy um, imbalance, where I just want to to be the pastor who teaches, mm -hmm. the pastor who preach, right? And it's interesting. I remember when um, I, I was on staff at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa in the early '90s, and when I left in 1994, um, you know, I. I was that guy. I just thought that because I can preach, I can teach, that qualified me as being a great, you know, or, or a competent pastor. And Chuck's response to me was so classic. He said, you know, John, I, I feel like the Lord brought you to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, to teach you about ministry, but he had to take you out to teach you how to be a pastor. You know, and I thought that was so insightful, especially at that time when the church was just, you know, every service was packed out and people were coming and 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 it was easy to fall into the trap that if you can speak well, if you've got eloquence, people are gonna be applauding you, kinda of like the celebrity pastor mm -hmm. thing that you're talking about. And then in your mind, once you preach your sermon, you disappear. You don't mm -hmm. you don't engage with people, you know, and and that's why I think this conversation is so healthy to be reminded that um, we don't preach just for celebrity status sake or for preaching's sake, but like you're saying, Richard, there's people that God's put in front of us that, that Acts chapter 20 says they were blood bought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're to love them that way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the classic text, I mean, there's a few of them, but the one that I think most of us would think of is 1 Peter 5, right? And so Peter says there, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Mm -hmm. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager mm -hmm. to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So good. Man, I love that. Awesome. It just lays it out, right? Yeah. And, um, but, but, you know, just thinking again about that whole thing of, um, uh, you know, they're under your care mm -hmm. and God expects you to, to watch over them. You think of those times in the prophets, uh, particularly Ezekiel and Jeremiah, where, man, the prophets are just thundering judgment against the shepherds who did mm -hmm. not yeah. feed the flock mm -hmm. but fed themselves. Yeah. And those were the leaders, the spiritual leaders of Israel at the time, right? And um, 
But, you know, God has, has given us this amazing privilege to care for his people, man. That's like, that's pretty serious stuff. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get much more serious than that. But I love when he says, um, you know, not lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock, mm -hmm. you know, being, being gentle, yeah. you know. I, I like that Isaiah passage, you know, he gently leads those that, that are with young. Mm -hmm. He holds them close to his heart. Yeah. That's what he does, and that's what he wants yeah. us to do. It's brilliant. Well. It's yeah. such a beautiful, it's like, get that in front of your face and don't forget it. <laughs> yeah. and just when you were reading, I'm just going, that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. That's it. That's good. Yeah. And you know, I, I got to say, the, the the being in a place where you are, where you can actually connect with people, um, one of the things that's always amazed me is like, um, whenever I've been here, like visiting on a Sunday, if, we, if Valerie and I are on our way to family camp or something, or watching you during the pastor's conference, like one of the things that always blesses me is you are always, as much as possible, with people mm -hmm. um, when we're at Creation Fest, you're with mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And that's like, well, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> a pastor's with the sheep. Yeah. Imagine that. Like, it's just, it's always blessed me. And, and, it, and it shows, um, you know, it, it shows like when you see the people who've come to know Jesus over the years at Creation Fest, like mm -hmm. that, those relationships, to mm -hmm. see those connections mm -hmm. still valid. Yeah. And I just, I, I, I'm, I'm always encouraged by mm -hmm. seeing that in, in, your, in your life. And yeah. I know that's, um, I, I'm by nature the step back guy. Mm -hmm. And you know, my wife says, oh, the people are over there, go over there <laughs> where the people are. So thanks for the example, <laughs> just saying, thanks for the example. <laughs> You're welcome. So when, um, as pastors, again, one of our responsibilities, I mean, we've got, we feed, we, we tend, we care, we protect, but also Ephesians 4.12 says we equip. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things of, of a pastor, just thinking about what Paul um, exhorted Timothy, to take the things that were entrusted to him and to entrust them to young men, faithful young men, so that they can um, just carry the tradition of a Jesus-style, you know, leadership, pastoral ministry. Um, what, what do you do as pastors um, wanting to invest into the next generation of guys that sense um, a call to pastoral ministry, and what counsel would you give to them in terms of how to prepare for that calling so that they can step into that role? Well, this is this is where I've always admired Richard and what God has done over the years, you know, through your ministry with that younger generation of guides of which you were very mm -hmm. much a part of that. Um, so, you're still doing that today. You haven't stopped. Mm. So what what's it what did it look like and what's it what's it looking like these days? Well, it, it looks the same but scaled differently. It was just letting people into your world mm -hmm. and wanting to find a way in, into their world. Yeah. Um, in when I was the high school pastor, like so many of those guys, they surfed, mm -hmm. and and I didn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I would drive them. Yeah. And we, I'd sit on the beach while they were having a session, and they'd get out, and we'd yeah. eat and talk. Um, we would meet in my office sometimes early, and then go across the street to Old Bill's Burgers. And mm -hmm. um, it was just time together. We'd have them in our home. Yeah. Um, and I remember Harris saying one time, because when I was asked to speak on how do you raise up leaders like it like I knew what I was doing I didn't know how, I didn't know how that was going to be the outcome of it yeah. um, and so I asked a few guys I said can you ask you to send me something and Rob Salvato and Mike and Jim like what did you see you're on the other side of this thing what did you see yeah. and Harris said I learned everything about ministry what what to do and what not to do <laughs> and it's because he got a front row yeah. seat, yeah. you yeah. know. So there's that you, you're making yourself available, yeah. visible, accessible, and with that comes all sorts of embarrassing moments and yeah. things that you wish you could have do-overs on. But I think that was kind of the thing. And now 
with the guys that are on staff at, um, up at Metro, it's kind of like, well, we, we spend Wednesdays together yeah. all, all, almost all day yeah. Wednesday. Yeah, and that, that's where, I mean, honestly, I've been um, so blessed and, and impressed with that aspect of, of what God does through you. I mean, even sometimes when you're describing your current situation with your guys, I'm like, dang, man, that's, I want to do that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it's really the same thing with me too, you know, manifested in a bit of a different way. But it, it's it's been more personal. Um, I, I'm not the best guy at like, hey, let's sit down and we'll go through this discipleship mm -hmm. manual together. Um, I, you know, I've just never been able to do that. I did, I did that with one person and that, and the reason why it worked with the one person I did it with is because they were so hungry and excited. Mm -hmm. They, they kept it going, you know, where I would like, Oh, I don't know. What do we say next? And I didn't even have to think that cause mm -hmm. they were, they were just going. So, so that worked out great. But for me, it's been more just, um, you know, sensing God's hand on somebody's life and saying, Hey, what are you doing right now? You know, I'm going to go do this. Why don't you come with me? Or, or even, hey, I'm going to take a trip over to London. Um, why don't you come along and mm -hmm. see see what happens? That that sort of thing, you know. And and I think in some ways Jesus did that, right? Yeah. I mean, he took these twelve guys and just he hung out with them and he instructed them. And I, I haven't been so much like, hey, let's hang out and hey, now sit down and let me, t yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, no. I, I'm not that good at that, um, but. Yeah, it, it is that um, the relational. Yeah. It, it's a relationship thing, and, and I think one thing we got to finish up here. But I, I think one last thing that we definitely should just touch on, and you mentioned it twice, John, and that's protecting the flock. Mm -hmm. So we we have an obligation also to guard the yeah. God's people. That's kind of a definition of what a shepherd did, yeah. right? David, he there was a bear and there was a lion that attacked the flock, and he took them down. And so we do have that aspect yeah. where we have to, as, as Paul said, we preach and we warn. And so, yeah. you know, we do it all from the biblical text, but mm -hmm. there, there are certainly times where we have to say, watch out for this and don't go there and, oh, that's wrong. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have to be disciplinary uh, measures sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, uncomfortably so. Yeah. Confrontation's yeah. the worst. Yeah. It's the worst, but it's part of it. I know, like who wants to do it, but it's inescapable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure like with the shepherd, like the least, you know, um, desired moment is when the lion comes and attacks the, <laughs> yeah, the flock. Yeah. I don't think the shepherd's sitting around waiting, come on, where's that lion? But that, but that is mm -hmm. such a crucial part to sanctification, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sanctification <laughs> is just the whole process of God um, keeping us in the right and protecting us from the wrong. And just even the Word of God, when it says that it, the Scriptures, it's inspired by God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And, 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 I'm, and, and again, I'm, I'm just so thankful that we're having this conversation because I think the way that society is trying to muzzle the church saying yeah. we can't talk about mm -hmm. certain topics because it's politically incorrect or whatnot, the, the, the Word of God is still the Word of God and yeah. God hasn't changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that now more than ever, um, I, I, I think that the pastor needs to be able to articulate truth with such full conviction in his God and in his Word because people are hearing nonsense mm -hmm. yeah. outside the church and you yeah. and and you just hope to provide an environment that when they walk in mm -hmm. even those difficult passages and even those words of correction that people can say i am hearing some common sense mm -hmm. right now and god loves me this much that he's willing to work through that individual and speak that kind of truth to me yeah so amen well fellas this was great, Brian, yeah. Richard. Thank you so much for this. Great to be together and great to be with you. And again, hope you're enjoying these conversations. And once again, if you have some pastor friends that you think might be benefited, uh, get the word out to them. So we look forward to being with you next time. And until then, uh, God bless you.